All right, we're all set. I've got the clicker. It's good. So hi, everybody. Good morning again. As a reminder, I'm Aaron Worsing, Professor of Wildlife Science, Environmental and Forest Sciences. And I'm really pleased to be here with you today to be able to give you some highlights from the wolf cougar component of the Washington Predator Prey Study. I also want to thank the Wolf Advisory Group and the Wolf Advisory Group Facilitation Team for inviting me to participate in this discussion panel. There we go. Before I go on, again, I also want to emphasize that I'm here on behalf of Lauren Satterfield, who did the work underlying this talk and produced all these results as part of her uh, dissertation research. Okay, and this follows along really nicely from where we, we left off with Taylor's talks, where uh, cougar predation in particular was sort of identified as a pretty important factor, at least for white-tailed deer population dynamics uh, in the Northeast part of the state. And that sort of brings us to the genesis of this particular component of the project, which uh, this, this wolf cougar component was really born of the idea that whereas we certainly recognized and appreciated that wolves can directly influence ungulate populations in Washington and elsewhere, both through predation as well as changing behavior and physiology, there's also an indirect pathway, and this sort of speaks to what Taylor was saying about this being a com community study as opposed to just a dyadic study. There's an alternative pathway by which wolves might influence ungulates, and that's by shaping the behavior uh, of the state's other apex predator that also relies heavily on ungulates, and that's cougars. So with this alternative pathway in mind, we launched the study in 2016 with two overarching questions in mind. Uh, the first of which is whether recolonizing wolves in Washington are competing with cougars for ungulate prey, which really speaks to the degree of dietary overlap, which sets the stage at least for the possibility of competition. And this is germane to the question of wolf impacts on ungulates, because if wolves are sort of matching the diet of cougars, it sets up at least the possibility that as more and more wolves arrive on the landscape, they could be augmenting or adding to pre-existing cougar predation pressure that's already being imposed on ungulate populations with at least the possibility for subsequent demographic impacts on ungulates. And the second question was, to what extent are recolonizing wolves, if at all, uh, dis spatially displacing cougars? And that's also relevant to the question of wolf ungulate interactions, because if wolves do displace cougars, they could be shaping the spatial pattern of cougar predation on ungulates. And that also could have demographic consequences for ungulates in, in Eastern Washington. So with these two questions in mind, uh, again, we, we launched a study in 2016 using those same two study areas. I won't belabor this because it's already been gone over in the previous two talks, but we worked both in the Okanagan and Northeast sites as well. Uh, here we just have the 2020 wolf facts, but that's pretty representative of what we were dealing with. Our main means of drawing inference, both about dietary overlap, as well as spatial interactions between wolves and cougars, was through the deployment of GPS or global positioning system collars. Over the course of four years, from 2016 to 2020, we deployed 60 of these collars on cougars, 34 females and 26 males were collared. And you can see there's a fairly even distribution of collar deployment across the two main study areas. And in partnership with WDFW and the Spokane Tribe of Indians, we were also able to leverage GPS data from collars on 17 wolves, nine females, and eight males in seven of the eight packs that used our two study areas. So a nice sample for both carnivores. In tracking the movements of collared individuals, both cougars and wolves, one of the things that we were paying special attention to was the formation of what's known as a GPS location cluster, like the one pictured here in this Google Earth image. What a cluster is, is an accumulation of relocations, all within close proximity of one another, often within just a few hundred meters over the span of just a few days. And what this can indicate is that an individual cougar or a pack of wolves have made a kill and are feeding on something. Right? And we're interested in feeding activity for a variety of reasons. And so when we detected one of these uh, clusters a little bit thereafter, we would venture in and actually do a forensic investigation of the cluster site to try to glean a lot of different information. All told, over the course of four years, we visited 500 cougar clusters, finding 369 carcasses, and 226 wolf clusters, finding 84 carcasses. And importantly, we sort of addressed diet in via two means during these investigations. First, again, we would do a forensic investigation 
which involves searching all around the site for all kinds of signs as to which prey species was killed and if there was enough evidence, what was the age, the sex, the condition of the prey species, and so on and so forth. But importantly, while doing these forensic investigations and indeed while walking to and from cluster sites, we were also opportunistically collecting scats for bone carnivores, which we later shipped over to the Levy Lab at Oregon State University for genetic analysis, which provided us actually with a much more thorough and complete picture of what both carnivores have been eating. Okay, so we had two means of, of getting a diet. And they were, as we'll see a little bit in this talk, the inferences that you get from cluster visits and, and scat analysis, neither is complete, but one complemented with one another can provide you with a pretty complete picture of what's going on. And so that sort of takes us back to the first major question of our, uh, to what extent do wolf and cougar diets overlap, which speaks to the degree of competition and the possibility that wolves are compounding uh, cougar predation pressure. And again, for the remainder of today's talk, because scat analysis gives you a more complete dietary picture, I'm going to give you scat analysis results, but I do want to emphasize that the insights we got from clusters and scats were similar. Here are our scat collection locations. Uh, you can see uh, cougar scat collection sites in green, wolf scat collection sites uh, in yellow. All told, we sent in 201 cougar scats and 199 wolf scats to Oregon State University for analysis. And you can see there that we got 162 cougar scats deemed to contain prey, 154 wolf scats. So giving us a pretty robust sample from both carnivores to sort of piece together their diet. From detection rates of different prey species, uh, we were, what we did is we converted the genetic analyses of the scats into a variety of different metrics. And the one I'm gonna show you here is percent frequency of occurrence on the y-axis, which is basically a measure of how often any given scat from a carnivore contained a particular prey species or prey grouping. And you can see the prey breakdowns here uh, in this color-coded key. I'm gonna draw your attention to a few major trends because I know there's a lot in here. We'll consider the Northeast first with cougars on top and wolves on the bottom. The first thing that jumps out is that cougars in the Northeast rely very strongly on white-tailed deer in both seasons with summer being sort of the half of the year that's snow off, winter being the half of the year that's snow on, so uh, white-tailed deer in, uh, in royal blue. Picture's a little bit more complex for wolves down here. You can see they have a little bit more of a mixed diet relying per, uh, primarily on moose and secondarily on white-tailed deer in the summer. And then it flips primarily on white-tailed deer, secondarily on moose in the winter. But one thing I do wanna point out is that both carnivores, and this goes back to Taylor's talk, are making considerable use of white-tailed deer which indicates there's a fair bit of dietary overlap and at least the possibility of competition. There's a lot, there's a lot that's also in here, but some of you may have noticed that not cougars, uh, but wolves in the Northeast also uh, uh, livestock tissue turned up in their scat, okay, in, in both seasons. Not a lot, but some. But here's where intersecting the cluster work and the scat analysis work gives you a complete picture of what's going on because our forensic investigations of episodes where we actually went in and found that, that wolves had made use of livestock indicated that the vast majority of wolf use of livestock was at carcass dump sites. So scavenging was the dominant driver, at least where we did our work. Different story in the Okanagan. So here, both cougars and wolves relied overwhelmingly on mule deer throughout the year, mule deer being in green here. So this really identifies this Okanagan system, even though there are white-tailed deer there, as really a one prey, two predator system with both carnivores converging on the same species. So higher possibility, at least, for competition for shared prey here. So just to quickly wrap this up before I go on to spatial interactions, cougars and wolves exhibit very high dietary overlap. We calculated a metric over overlap. It was high across the board, especially in the Okanagan where mule deer predominate the diets of both carnivores. And so what that indicates is there's at least a high potential for competition. And I emphasize potential because dietary overlap doesn't mean that two species are actually competing for the same food. It depends on how super abundant the food is, right? There's plenty enough to go around. You have very minimal competition. But what it does say is that when and where prey numbers are limiting, these carnivores could be hotly contesting for food, particularly in the Okanagan for mule deer. So we need to know something about prey availability and limitation. 
This threat also suggests that wolves do have the potential to add to cougar predation pressure on white-tailed deer and especially mule deer in the Okanagan. But this impact depends on how much extra mortality they inflict, right? And, and Taylor has some information to speak to that. Interestingly, overlap between cougars and wolves was mediated by wolf use of moose in the Northeast. And that highlights moose as potentially a key factor for dietary segregation between these two carnivores. And that means moose could buffer against added predation, any added predation pressure that wolves might uh, generate, right? And so it sort of shines a spotlight on, on moose uh, maintenance and perhaps recovery, especially in the Northeast. Finally, wolves, but not cougars, were found to make use of a substantial amount of livestock, especially in the Northeast, but some of the Okanagan as well. But again, I want to emphasize that most of our cluster visits indicated that most of that use was in the form of scavenging. And from a management perspective, that actually shines a spotlight on carcass management at dump sites as one way of attempting to mitigate that wolf-livestock relationship. I would love to be able to wax elegiacally about any one of these topics, but given that I have 15 minutes, I'm gonna move on to spatial interactions. And if you noticed, I changed the title from what was there before, because now I'm gonna give you some late breaking, never before given results on spatial interactions between these two carnivores, which are also relevant, again, to the impact of wolves on ungulates. They hear transmitted through any changes to cougar behavior. We, as the basis for our exploration of how cougars respond spatially to recolonizing wolves, we leverage those GPS data I mentioned before from those collar deployments. So you can see up here, all these orange points are relocations of cougars in the two study areas. You can see we had nice spatial coverage. We had well over 100,000 locations of cougars to work with. And as the, the basis for modeling the relationship between wolves and cougars, we use step selection functions. And I don't want to belabor how those work, but just briefly, a step, step selection function is a modeling procedure where we break the movement path of individual hollered animals into a series of steps. And Beth went over those earlier. And for each one of those steps, what we do is compare measured covariates, forest cover, elevation, whatever you like, human footprint, at the, for the step that was actually taken, the move that was actually made, two measures of similar covariates at a series of randomly chosen moves that could have been made by the same individual during that same step. And what that comparison allows us to do then is actually quantify the degree as animals move across the landscape to which they overuse, indicating selection, or underuse, indicating avoidance, any particular covariate relative to random expectations. And what we can do is we can actually quantify the degree of overuse or underuse across the full gradient across the landscape for any covariate. And that gives us a, a picture of what's known as relative selection strength, okay, across the entire gradient for any covariate. Here, that's wolf localized density distribution, which is a holistic measure of wolf use across the landscape that adjusts for pack size. It gives you a sense of the overall probability of encountering a wolf for a cougar or anyone else. So I'm gonna give you a series of these relative selection strength uh, figures now. And what I wanna point out is for these, Values that are under one indicate avoidance. Values that are over one and up to infinity in, in, indicate strengthening selection for something, increasing use. What you can see here with that in mind is that as wolf LDD, or the probability of encountering wolves, increases, cougars increasingly avoid those locations. So cougars avoid wolves strongly in space, and they do so to the degree that increases significantly with the sort of long run average probability that a cougar is gonna actually bump into a wolf or a pack at any particular location, right? So this indicates a, a strong degree of sensitivity in cougars to the, the probability of bumping into wolves. And they really stay away from areas that are sort of poor use areas for wolves. But the picture is even more interesting and, and there's so much more I have to leave out. So please ask me questions afterwards about additional aspects of the interaction. But what's cool here is that wolves don't just avoid cougars, but they actually change the way they use other resources in the landscape as a function of wolf presence or localized density distribution. So here we have selection strength for forest cover increasing from very low to very high. As you can see, and we have two different settings of wolf presence. We just broke it down categorically into high, red, low, blue. Where wolves are scarce, cougars select for the densest forest. And that makes sense. They are creatures of relatively dense forest, forest cover and topographic cover, 
facilitate their stalking hunting mode as Beth went into earlier. Well, what's interesting is that when you switch to areas of high wolf use, yes, cougars are still selecting towards the forest end of the spectrum, but their selection for those densest forest patches actually goes down significantly. And the highest levels of selection are actually more at the intermediate forest cover levels of 50 to 75 percent. So something interesting is going on between wolves and cougars here, but it's in an unanticipated direction. If anything, our, our thought going in was that the more you expose cougars to wolves, the more they're going to retreat to the dense part of the forest because wolves are typically creatures of the open where they run down prey. What's going on? I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but let me give you one more tidbit first. Cougars also appear to change their use of, or selection for elevation as a function of wolf use. So again, high wolf use in red, low wolf use in blue, where wolves are relatively scarce in the landscape. Cougars select for mid elevations, which is what's been seen in other systems. But when you bump wolf use up, cougars actually avoid mid elevations and move to sort of relatively low ends of the elevation spectrum. Another pretty significant effect. So, what explains this? Because again, going in, we might have anticipated because wolves are creatures in low country that with greater wolf exposure, cougars should actually go up higher elevation, but they're not doing that. I think the answer to the story is that you have to bring people. And this kind of speaks some of the questions that you had, I think, coming out of the previous conference, is that there's a very strong human effect here, which as Taylor mentioned, separates this study from a lot of other studies of wolf and cougar interactions with prey, as well as with each other. They've all been occurred in wilderness areas and protected areas where here we have an anthropogenic landscape where with humans as a major ecosystem player. This is a relative selection strength figure from actually a companion paper led by Laura Prue. And it's for both carnivores in relation to the human footprint, which is a holistic integrated continuous index of overall human impacts in the landscape, accounts for a variety of different land uses, but the higher the footprint, the greater the human use. And you can see here that both carnivores select for low human footprint and strongly avoid high human footprint. So both carnivores seem to be avoiding people, but the key to remember here is that yes, cougars are avoiding people, but so are wolves. And some work by Sarah Bassing uh, as part of her dissertation showed that in this system, Wolves, contrary to what's been found in some other systems, show very strong selection for dense forest. Uh-oh. So what that could really mean is that cougars are sort of stuck between people, two enemies, people and wolves. And because wolves are also avoiding people and apparently avoiding them by going to dense forest, that forces cougars to find that happy medium. Enemy free space means intermediate levels of forest cover away from both people and wolves. This has never been demonstrated before. So just as a quick summary, both uh, cougars and wolves strongly avoid human development in these systems. And what that could suggest is that humans may be creating a spatial shield against predation by both of these carnivores, okay, underscoring the impacts of humans on ecosystems. But cougars not only avoid people, they also avoid wolves and they alter their resource use where wolf use is high. And again, as I was mentioning, what that could suggest is that cougars are sort of caught in a vice between two enemies, humans and wolves, resulting in unexpected spatial shifts, like away from the densest forest, whereas a lot of work in protected areas like the greatest, greater Yellowstone ecosystem has found that when you confront cougars with wolves, they go up and they go into denser forest and greater cover. Not what we saw here. And again, I think that's because wolves are simultaneously responding to people. So people are sort of reshuffling the entire deck here as far as the spatial interactions. Going back to the diagram that I gave you at the very beginning of that alternative pathway, the other thing this suggests is that wolf presence, even if they're not inflicting that much direct mortality on ungulates, they could very well be indirectly influencing ungulate populations by shaping where cougars go. Okay, deserves more attention, in particular in light of what, what Taylor pointed out about pretty heavy cougar predation. So an interesting possible, we don't know yet, but possible alternate pathway. Uh, I know I'm out of time, so I just want to thank Lauren Satterfield again for doing all the work underlying this. Uh, I want to thank all of you for listening and recognize some of our other project partners and funders. And maybe we have time for questions or we could go to open questions. Thanks. Thank you.